So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this special plenary session on evolving architecture of the 21st century grid with two-way power flows. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are our chair, our moderator, and our eminent speakers, as you can see on the screen. And I'm uh, now going to bring forward our uh, moderator. But before that happens, I'm going to, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, inform all of you that uh, this session is going to be moderated by Sri Ravi Sitapati, uh, Chair ISGF Working Group on RE and Microgrid and Chairman Biosiris, and he's going to be our moderator and our chair for this session. Uh, after over 35 years career in electric utilities, power systems, it's Sri Ravi it's fine, it's fine. Okay. It's right. fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Introduce everybody by their names, please. Introduce okay. everybody by their names and titles, and people can read up their bios. All right. So next, as you can see, is our theme presenter, uh, Sri Mani Vadari, who's the president of Modern Grid Solutions USA. Well, welcome to you. And these are our eminent speakers, uh, Mr. Andres Carvalho, CMG Consulting USA. He's the founder and CEO of CMG Consulting. We have Professor Saiful Rahman, who's an IEEE Life Fellow. Director, Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute, USA, and 2022 IEEE President-Elect. We have Mr. Mark McGranigan, who is a EPRI Fellow and VP Power Delivery and Utilization with the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, Mr. Nadir Farah, President. Uh, He's not joining. Mr. Nadir Farah uh, has excused himself. He is unable to join. We have Mr. Luciano Martini, Chair Executive Committee, is gone, uh, who is the Director of the Transmission and Distribution Technologies Department. Uh, Mr. Andrew Dicker, who's, uh, who leads Accenture's network of, the, network of the Future Initiatives as part of Accenture's Utility Strategy Practice in USA. And we have Mr. Anjan Bose, uh, and uh, he is uh, Professor Anjan Bose at Washington State University, okay. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have uh, Sri Abhay Chaudhary, who is Director of Projects Power Grid. And Mr. Kenneth Butka, Senior Partner, Bell Labs Consulting. Okay. Uh, Mr. Abhay Chaudhary is being uh, replaced by Sri Subir Sen, who is joining us, Executive Director, Power Grid. And uh, no. then we have uh, Mr. Anjan Bose, who is. Uh, no, no, he's all, he already told. There are some, there are some problems. All right. Last so, also Mr. Adarsh Nagarajan, Group yeah. Manager, Power System Design and Planning, yeah. National yeah. Renewable yeah. Energy Laboratory. Thank you, Adarsh Nagarajan. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, the slide is slightly wrong. It's actually Mr. Radharsh Nagarajan, Group Manager, Power System Design and Planning, National Renewable Laboratory, NREL. With that, sir, I won't waste any any more time, and I'm going to hand over to our chair and moderator, Sri Ravi Sitapati. Sir, all yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. I see that the, the money is still awaited. I don't know if he's already joined. But nevertheless, we'll start, and then we'll hopefully he'll be uh, here in a few minutes. I think as the session involved, there is no need for me to articulate again and again what the subject matter is. It's something very important. It's a placement out there, much like climate change and others, you know, what do we intend to do in the future? And it's all, everybody agrees to that. The question is, how do we go about doing it? Each country seems to have a different take on it. So today we have assembled perhaps the best of the best in terms of over 11 speakers uh, to be able to articulate what these steps would be. They come from different, uh, what I call, fields. On the technology side, we have power systems, we have control systems, we have data, IT, telecom. On the professional side, we have academics, we have R&D, we have practitioners, we have utilities. And then and on the geography side, we have the United States, we have the EU, and we have India. And so the question, I think, has been framed around, what will this look like in the future? What are likely to be the pumps? And how do we solve these problems? Some of these are very problems that have not been solved in 15 years. And so we still have the issue of agreements on certain areas. And uh, we don't have a clear roadmap at all. So with that, I would like to open it up to the plenary speaker, Mani Vadri, if he's there. Uh, Mani, the floor is yours. <laughs> so he's not there. OK. Um, this is great. So, Reggie or somebody, can you just quickly phone him and see whether he is up? 
it's 5 30 in the morning for him i see anjan is up so why he should be up too adarsh is also up so he should be up adarsh uh, yeah good morning good afternoon so maybe uh, he will join later you could start with uh, uh, professor boss or any one of uh, over to you devi sir okay we are putting sort of the reverse um okay i will start with the person who knows this subject well he knows india well my former alba beta colleague as well and a distinguished professor uh, with anjan bose so anjan i'm going to start with you and i want to hear your thoughts about this subject matter as to where you see it and how do you see it evolving um okay um can you hear me properly yeah i can hear you yeah all right yeah, um um how do i share my screen i don't see a um share button at the bottom right in the middle okay uh, uh is it fine now yeah. can you see yeah. it? can you see see my screen yes 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 very okay. much all right great so i have a few slides here and i i think i will limit my um uh talk uh uh, to just a, a very narrow slice of uh, uh, what is happening. And uh, those of you who know me, I've spent most of my life in, in grid operations. So I will just talk about what the challenges are going to, uh, going to be faced by the grid operators as we evolve into this new architecture uh, that is happening. So, um, See if I can figure out how to. Go on screen mode. All right. So um, I, I think this is known to everybody, but just to just to set the stage. Um, uh, so the grid architecture of the power grid is changing more uh, in this fashion than this. Um, so we're having less centralized generation connect and the centralized generation was always connected to transmission. We're getting more distributed generation and a, and a chunk of that is going to be connected to distribution. The, and the generation that is uh, being connected to distribution and even otherwise uh, much of it is inverter connected. They're renewables, they're, they're, they're not 60 hertz rotating machines, All right? So, uh, and then uh, as we know, uh, the renewables uh, are not are intermittent resources. And so the amount of uh, intermittent resources that we'll need will be more than what we have in terms of fossil resources. That is that if you're going to replace hundred megawatts plant, uh, a rotating uh, coal plant, um, you will need to have a lot more than 100 megawatts of, say, solar uh, to be able to provide the same amount of energy. Now, this is well known, and it's some, it, it, depending on um, what the availability of uh, uh, solar and wind is, uh, you're going to have anything between three to five times as much capacity needed. Not only that, because they don't, uh, the sun doesn't shine and all that, uh, you're going to have to have a lot of uh, uh, storage as well. So um, now the, the things that may help here is that the distribution side is getting smart uh, very fast. That is, there's a, going to be a lot more switchable uh, uh, a lot more intelligent switches, a lot more controllable loads and generation and so on. So ha said, sa having said that, let's, uh, uh, let me just take a few applications at the control centers uh, for control that is going to be impacted by this new architecture. And, uh, uh, so, and, and I'm going to pick the very normal control I mean, not even those difficult things like what happens during storms or what happens under uh, emergency conditions and all of that. Just think about the normal stuff. Uh, so there are some things that happen automatically, like uh, AGC, uh, like uh, voltage control of buses. Now, what happens, 
so I'm going to tell you that these have to be enhanced if the architecture is going to be very different. So I'm going to pick a few more on the manual operation side. That is the operators. What do they do? Well, they, they, they only watch the generation control and the volt controls, which are automatically being done. Uh, they just have to make sure that there's enough generation reserves to do the AGC. They have to make sure that they have, they have to set the voltage set points at the different buses and so on. And then they do the topology changes. That is, they open breakers and close breakers, depending on the conditions. Uh, if uh, something, some transmission line gets overloaded or something like that, they might have to reroute some of the energy. And then finally, I'm just going to say very little about uh, protection because we don't normally consider them under the uh, uh, under the system operators, but protection actually happens uh, uh, behind the scenes and does impact and uh, uh, the whole operational scheme. So, uh, so let's jump into uh, now. I've got the same things again um, uh, in the what I had in the last slide, talking about automatic control. Now, what happens is that AGC today is done by the TSO or the ISO at the, at the EMS level where the balancing is done. And all of the generation they're changing, they're controlling are all on the, uh, on the transmission side. But that's not going to be the case once a whole bunch of the generation moves into the distribution side. And so now you have to, the EMS operator or the EMS itself will have to actually send generation signals to the distribution side, which means that they'll have to, that there has to be much, much tighter control and coordination between the EMS and the DMS. And usually under one EMS, one balancing authority, you may have many uh, DMSs or, or distribution operators working. Okay, similarly, uh, on the voltage control, which um, most around, uh, most pe most people are doing a local voltage control with local measurements, and so it op operates nicely. Uh, uh, although in some countries now, China, uh, Italy, France, uh, we're doing some regional voltage control and coordination as well. But now that gets much more complicated if a lot of this uh, generation, again, is on the distribution side. Uh, the normal operational process says that uh, the dis that the voltage control on the transmission side is usually under the transmission operator and voltage control on the distribution side is opposite but uh, we will come into situations where uh, the uh, you don't may not have enough vars on uh, transmission and distribution to do uh, do uh, completely separate kind of uh, uh, of controls and between transmission and distribution. So again, the EMS DMS con con coordination uh, becomes very, very important. And if you think about it, remember this is automatic control, nobody's touching anything. So this EMS and DMS con coordination has to be done at four second intervals and, and, uh, and automatically. Look at what happens to manual operation. If you're gonna keep generation reserves, let's say for AGC, um, now, you may not have enough uh, reserves on the transmission side anymore as, as, as time goes on. So now, now you have to talk to your DSOs to find out who has uh, enough reserves on the distribution side on real power. Uh, similarly, for uh, to setting up voltage set points, you have to coordinate because if you, especially if VARs are going to cross the TND boundary. All right, so again, a lot more coordination the, and topology changes. See, right now, there's very little topology changes that can be done on the distribution side. They're basically radial and, uh, and, uh, and some sectionalizing is possible today, uh, but uh, more automatic sectionalizing are coming. And uh, so again, uh, you're going to have a lot more switches and topology changes going on on the uh, on the distribution side, especially if you're going to have a lot of generators generation over there. So you can see even on the manual operation, this TSO DSO coordination becomes a huge operation with a large amount of uh, 
data going back and forth between the DMS, DS, DMS. Finally, I'll just, as I said, I'm not going to talk more uh, too much about protection, but remember already the protection is being hit. We're seeing special protection schemes to do ride-throughs. Uh, we're seeing that uh, 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 wind farms are causing oscillations, which will require new protection schemes. And on the distribution protection, this is where this uh, two-way flow comes in. And as you know, this is uh, the, the whole distribution protection uh, with handling uh, two-way flow and large amounts of generation on the distribution. New ways of coordinating this protection system. Uh, so now let me add one more challenge, which is not talked about very much, which is the load growth that we are going to see. Uh, so the natural load growth in developed countries is very slow, but the developing countries are still going somewhere between five and 10% a year. Okay, that's the natural one. Now, as I the other added uh, problem here is, as I said, if you're going to replace our fossil generation, the capacity of renewables that you have to put in and storage becomes many times the capacity that you're replacing. So now you've complicated both on the load side and the uh, generation side. Now think of in the next five years, what's going to happen to transportation Transportation as we go to electric vehicles. This is going to be the fastest move of loads, non-electrical loads to electric loads. Now you can consider in the US 40% uh, of transportation, 40% uh, of the maximum demand of electricity is uh, goes into transportation. Um, so that's another big jump. And finally, people are talking about by the middle of the century or by 2070, a lot of the manufacturing will move to electric. Now we are talking about maybe quadrupling uh, our, in the next two decades, uh, our load. Now this is huge. Nobody knows how to handle uh, this, I mean, this is not going to put only uh, a lot of uh, stress on the investment process. That is not, people only talk about that generation needs to be fixed. Uh, a new generation will be needed, but a new trend, a lot of new transmission and distribution are also going, going to be needed. And uh, this will challenge the financing capabilities of the country, of, the, of these grids, planning uh, uh, methods, uh, construction uh, will is going to be stressed just because of the supply chain issues. Uh, but the bigger issue, see, I'm looking at it from the operations side. Nobody knows yet how to uh, how to operate grids that are going to be going to in say 20 years running about four times as much load on on the system. And the reason we don't know that is that it can't be just linearly changed with the architecture, the basic architecture underneath is changing. So what we're going to see is a communications, computation, control, a lot of this automation stuff that people are talking about will have to be invented between now and the next 20 years. So key takeaways, uh, uh, so the power grid architecture is transforming. We all know that. The fossil fuel replacement means higher capacity of renewables than what it's uh, replacing. Uh, the, the renewable generation will be dispersed heavily and into the distribution systems. Higher electrification will increase electric load. We sort of went through that. Now, um, and so now, now this is this is going to be a big challenge for operation, and I'm not even talking about the needs for operators to be much more trained, uh, but also hard, there is no way that we can help, we can operate the system with as much manual intervention that we do today. So you're going to have. Uh, it, we'll just have to have higher levels of automation and whether whether you you do it with data science or artificial intelligence or whatever, uh, things are going to get much more difficult on the human operator. And finally, the you, we talk about the architecture of the power grid itself, the generation transmission distribution, but really we have to completely invent the new set of uh, the architecture, the uh, 
that 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 we talk about in terms of EMS, DMS, markets, protection, all of those will have to be different. There has to be a lot more coordination between them and to handle the new underlying grid architecture. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Anjan, as always, very precise, very operational, uh, raising the right questions. In fact, the money is already there. He was waiting, ringing the doorbell, and nobody let him in, I think. So anyway, he is not late, but he is at the door. Uh, money in very many ways. Anjan has raised questions on your presentation, so I will allow you to present. But I think good set of questions have already been sort of at least raised here, and we can articulate that after your presentation. So over to you, Mani. Thank you, Ravi. Can you all hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so, Anjan, as soon as you sh stop, I can start sharing. Okay, um, I think I'm... I'm... Excellent. Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can see your screen. see my screen? Yep, yep. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I, I actually do have to thank Dr. Anjan Bose because he set the stage perfectly for what I was going to say. So uh, uh, it's it's almost as if, as if we prepped for this. So uh, that I think was absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to get started uh, where we are uh, moving forward. I think one of the things that I wanted to start with was kind of where Dr. Bose left it, right? We are now moving from a one-way power system flow to a multi-way power system flow. And this is not just happening at the transmission level, distribution level, you're seeing at the manufacturing level, and you're seeing it literally at all levels. So it's like the operations of the utility at various levels need to change. If I continue down the path, the second piece of change that is happening is to look at it from the perspective of new participants who are coming in. This is almost unprecedented. So if you're able to look at my screen, you get the view of, we, ha we had a bunch of participants before, and now we start seeing a distribution system operator, retail markets are being talked about, transactive energy is being talked about, Microgrids are coming in, which means microgrid operators come into play. And then we start seeing things like the community choice aggregate. Of course, much of this is happening in the US and I don't want to uh, limit it, but I think this kind of a situation is being talked about across the world. So it's important to understand what all of these changes are. So then coming back to where Dr. Bose left off, that we are seeing a whole bunch of systems, some new, some existing, that all need to work much more effectively. This is very important because as, as Dr. Bose said, and I'm, I'm so glad he went before me because it was almost as if Ravi had planned this whole thing uh, because it allows me to leverage what he said because these are systems that are coming in that are going to be asked to do things very, very differently than what they did before. The EMS is no longer just a system that manages and operates and uh, sets up the transmission system, but at some level, it is doing the balancing authority for a broad variety of uh, dispersed resources which could be connected either to the transmission system or to the distribution system or inside a microgrid. A lot of these uh, generators, as Dr. Bose pointed out, are also uh, inverter based, which means that they don't come with the normal kinds of things like inertia and stuff that we are all so used to as power system engineers, or at least many of us as power system engineers. So keeping those things in mind, um, this, this came out of a work that I did for the Department of Energy, where I said at a high level, the architecture of the grid is going to be changing. Sorry, is changing. And to be able to address it, the OT architecture, the operations technology architectures also need to change. So in this page, I'm going to sit in this page for a little while because I want to talk through 
some of those key components. The key components are you start seeing smart inverter systems like the ones in a solar rooftop photovoltaic system, home energy management, wind, buildings, microgrids, all of them connecting into a grid or being a part of the grid, along with the grid itself becoming much more complex because we are now having devices both uh, at the grid, at the edge, and behind the meter. So how do you bring all of these things into a common coordinating mechanism? Because to be fair, if you, got, if you have a solar farm, let's say a mid-size one to five megawatt solar farm, it may be connected to the distribution system, but the physics of the grid doesn't differentiate from the transmission system or the uh, distribution system. The physics of the grid says we are all connected in as one single balancing authority. So I started creating this mechanism where I said, along with all of these things, how do we make sure that we are able to run the grid reliably, predictably, and in a resilient manner? So the systems that need to get in need to start thinking about those things. I'm gonna continue down the path and say, okay, how do we describe the picture that I just put out there in the screen, on the screen? I wanted to bring it, bring up the concept, something that most vendors are already moving towards, by the way, the concept of an IT slash data bus and an OT slash control bus. Cybersecurity becoming a very important part of this whole equation requires that all of these new participants need to be able to participate in a very efficient manner, but more importantly, in a secure manner. And the IT slash data bus was intended to define a mechanism or to provide a mechanism that allowed these systems to talk to each other, passing data back and forth, but separating that from the controls mechanism because you don't want somebody to get into that. So the idea was that if I separate out these two mechanisms, the control bus, the OT slash control bus could be much more secure that then allowed those operational actions to take place. One of the key mantras that we came out with was, we called it model, forecast, dispatch, and settle. So these four things become important because one of them says modeling and requires me to make sure that I know where all of these devices are what their characteristics are, what are their capabilities, where are they located, so that when I am forecasting, I understand how much is actually going to hit the grid at what point in time. Then you come back to what Dr. Bose was talking about, which is the whole concept of dispatching it. Dispatching is not just about dispatching, sending control signals, to generators, but dispatching is also about understanding how the system is working so that I'm sending control signals to the right generators to get to the right level. The standards given architecture is required, is a requirement, because if you think about it, all of these things need to be able to talk to each other. The photovoltaic on my roof, connected to the uh, FedEx truck that is delivering supplies and el electric truck that is delivering supplies to the factory that Dr. Bose was talking about, to the utility, to the consumer, all of them need to be talking at some level, some level of standardized protocols so that they're able to talk to each other and they understand each other. We need to have some level of standardized models and then the last one that as something that we need to learn from the computer industry becomes important because then we need to be able to understand that the self-registration of devices. If a wind farm is connected to the grid, I need to know about it. If it is disconnected from the grid, I need to know about it. I, the system operator, needs to know about it. And I think at some point in time, we need to get to a place where 
each of these 40 components also starts some level of self-registration, also self-awareness. That starts becoming an important piece to all of these things. Well, the first question that somebody can ask me is, uh, what is it going to cost me? How do I get there? The key to all of this is not, how do I get there right now, but how do I get there over time? Because as, again, Dr. Bose said, this is all going to cost a lot of money and we can't get there tomorrow, which means that you set up a roadmap, which will probably be different for each utility that then defines what those things are defines how do we get there and defines also when do we get there. We base them on a set of guiding principles and I've given you a short list of those could be different for your utility and using them you define what my roadmap is from a utility perspective. I'm going to start closing it up in the conclusions how should the grid and their architectures be redesigned? They need to evolve. They cannot just go from point A to point B. We don't know what that end state looks like, but they need to evolve. Because our customers are demanding green power, the utilities are interested in getting there. The future also requires a reliance be behind on behind the meter assets further requiring the robustness of the architecture and the secureness of the architecture. Something that almost nobody talks about is this whole concept of transparency. Transparency is important because let us say I'm a solar farm operator and I get curtailed by the grid operator. I need to know why I got curtailed. I also need to know why am I being curtailed more often than anybody else? And how is other how are other people getting curtailed? So understanding that transparency becomes important, not just to the solar farm operator, but also to people like the regulators and other stakeholders who are watching this. We are moving towards a data rich environment. Understanding what these things are, how do we gain more knowledge out of it starts becoming important. I'm going to take us to the last page where we said Next steps, understand we need a roadmap, understand the business constructs, who are all the different types of businesses that are entering it, understand the technological considerations. We talked about a couple of buses, an OT bus and an IT bus. As more and more of these participants get in, cybersecurity becomes very critical. Be ready for new types of OT and IT technologies. Cloud is coming in. AI, ML is coming in. Machine learning is coming in. But the key to all of this is that the timing def is defined by the changes at your utility. What works in the US may not work right now in India or in the Europe and may work at a different pace. However, I think it's an important takeaway is that this is not a theoretical exercise. This is a very, very practical, a very, very real exercise. And all of us need to be thinking about it in a very clear, concise, and directed manner. With that, I think, Ravi, I've taken away my 15 minutes of time. I will hand it back to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mani. Precise and very concise, practical as always. So when I met you, I think almost 18 years ago, we first met in your, I you were wearing your previous different hat. We had lunch together. Absolutely. <laughs> and then we have met several times far later. There were five takeaways, and I'm just going to pose it for other people to maybe react and maybe money you can get back to it at the end. The one is the whole area that the retail, which is loosely coupled, is where the action is going to be. And the question is, will we allow it to be loosely coupled to manage it? The second takeaway was the non-core, which is microgrid, grid edge, DR, BESS, is becoming the core as you move forward in the technology in the distributed area. So what impact will it have as the non-core becomes core? So that is the second big question I'm raising here. You correctly mentioned about ITOT, and you know that this has been on for quite some time, decades maybe. And how do you see this being resolved given other issues that utilities have always raised about segregation of IT and OT for its protection, even today, you know, we maintain the two distinctly different. 
The next question I have is seven years plus. Given even today some of the challenges in Europe, we are seeing the interdependencies between adversaries and adversaries on oil and gas, right? And so Anjan was very kind when he said four times renewables, right? Actually, it's probably seven times if you take away geographic dispersion where one renewable is not impacting the other renewable because of similar climates. So, so that is another uh, question to be raised. And the last is, I think you raised was transparency. I fully agree. How do you see transparency becoming accepted, agreed upon in terms of model, forecast, dispatch, and settlement, which I think is a franchise right. And, and you're bringing up that kind of democracy, right? It's a fine area of how we see retail democracy versus centralized democracy. So I'm not gonna ask you to answer the question, but maybe others can uh, also address it as they speak. The next person I'm going to invite is whom I would like to call him the emperor. He heads the largest energy engineering association in the world. Many of the good things that we have talked about and are talking about is as a result of that association's work. But I'm going to ask him to speak as to how he sees IEEE basically managing some of the system issues as opposed to the silo issues that it does through its standards. So Saifur, over to you. You're muted, Saifur. Thank Saifu. you very much. Thank you very much. So let me try to share my screen if I may. Can you see my full screen now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mani and Anjan Bose and, and Ravi, everybody. Very interesting. You made my job easier. I'm not going to spend so much time on other things. Uh, before I get started, you see these transmission lines? I want to point out, you talk, Anjan talked about four times, Mani talks about seven times. If we do large scale cross border power transfer, we can do much better. And I'll bring at, us to that point at the end of my presentation. Mm -hmm. So this is a great evolution. You have seen that. I'm going to spend a lot of time. Only thing I want to point out, the grid today is not grid only. The telecom network plays a big role in the grid. Very important. Absolutely. Without the telecom network, we don't have, we don't have a smart grid, for example. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you the purple part is the old grid, green is the new grid, the difference is telecom, storage, renewables, all that kind of stuff. So this is the new picture and IEEE Power Energy Society talks a lot about this. You know, in IEEE we have power energy, computer, communications, signal processing, power electronics. All of these are acting close with us to do this. We have a conference coming up in April 23 in San Diego, the Grid Edge Conference. That's where we bring in the communication people, computer people, signal people to power industry. So this is going to be a very different picture for us who are in the power business to deal with those people who are helping us go forward. So this is the evolution, one, two, three, four, five, talk about Smart energy, renewables, biomass, DER, all that, fine. Flexible distribution, we just heard that from Anjan Bose and, and Manny already, not spending time on this. Active energy efficiency, very important. We talk about reducing generation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is okay. But if we focus on energy efficiency, you can run the same building with less electricity. That means you, ne you need less electricity, which means less CO2. It's very important. We sometimes miss that point. So I want to make sure our planners and operators do not focus only on generation reduction, focus as well on energy consumption reduction. Number four, electric vehicles. This is going to be a game changer. A data from USDOE which shows today's U.S. demand is about 1,000 gigawatts, roughly, 1,000 gigawatts. 2040, 
that becomes 4,000 gigawatts, 4,000 gigawatts. So four times the demand today. How do you manage that? We do not know, frankly speaking. Part of that will be on the, on the uh, meter side, so it's not all transmission, but electric vehicle is a big thing. Electrification of heating technologies will be big player. For example, in the UK, those of you know the system there, home heating is primarily gas and oil today, primarily. 2025, they would not allow any new construction to have oil and gas heating. No, all electric, 25. And 2030, they'll stop selling any heating equipment with gas or oil. All of that will move to electricity. That's a big thing. And finally, demand response. Talked about the demand response in terms of peak reduction, energy efficiency. This is the picture we see from the top. Going forward, this is my prediction for the future. I believe in the long run, we'll have intelligent interconnected microgrids overall. We see in Chicago now, Bronzeville is part of the city of Chicago. The microgrid setting up that network, about 10, 12 megawatt load, that part. So I'm seeing here many small microgrids in the middle, rooftop solar, electric vehicle, many of them, some are large, some are small. The one in the middle, that's our bigger microgrid, connected to commercial buildings, wind turbine through transformers on the right, low, lower right hand side. We have transmission line from power plant and storage batteries. So we can do it right. And people ask me, when do I think we'll have smart grid all over the world? It's not gonna happen overnight. We may never have a full utility like Dominion Energy, Duke Power, all smart. It's not gonna happen. We'll see pockets will be smart like this. Like Chicago Comet, they're making Bronzeville a microgrid with 80% local supply capacity. That will grow over time. If you as an utility engineer or planner or, or, or manager want to build your system as smart as you want to, you have to do piece by piece and then connect them like this picture shows. Going forward, this is, we talked about this already. I have on the right hand side, electric vehicle, which will be big game changer going forward. Now, this is my way of explaining what I just said. We'll have big focus on storage. You can see my picture changing. You first you store it happening today in some cities, people are buying battery and using electric vehicle to be as self-sufficient as possible. Take the case of how electric Hiko. In Hawaii, the cheapest electricity is at from three to five PM, cheapest electricity. Because that's when all the solar comes out and the demand for power is less for the power company to do this. Power company is charging them extra money to remain connected to the grid, just hooked up. Many people are buying batteries, put it in their garage, and going off the grid. We talk about this 4,000 gigawatt demand, it's not going to be all supplied by the power company. So this is the thinking we have to change as we go forward. So vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle is going to happen. In Virginia, the plan by the, low, not plan, going right now, local power company, they're giving schools electric school buses, electric school buses, cost over three times as much. But they're using those school buses during the low demand time from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to send the power back to the grid, the demand is high. So in this case, school bus is V2G, run by the power company, and they are reducing their peak load by discharging batteries going forward. So that's happening already here. So this is how I see things are changing. Well, evolving our delivery system. Historically, we said demand-driven supply, right? You forget to demand and build generation to meet the expected demand, demand-driven supply. Now, if supply is a lot of solar and wind, you cannot depend, you cannot depend on the supply 100%. 
I call it the new reality, supply-driven demand. As the supply fluctuates, you adjust your demand so that you are not short. How you do this, I've done those at Virginia Tech, we can forecast the solar output next three minutes with 98% accuracy, 98%. That two, three minutes enough time for me to manage my building energy management system so that I can dim the lights, I can turn the temperature up in summer for air conditioning. So as the sunshine level goes down, my rooftop supply goes down, simultaneously, my load goes down and I can make the adjustments. So this is what I call supply-driven demand going forward. So this is the future that I see. We have smart buildings, which is, I just explained, it is adjusting its load depending on the supply. Multiple smart buildings on a campus can make a campus smart. A city may have multiple campuses. Campus does not mean only college campus. It could be a corporate headquarters could be of some office buildings in one area. They're smart city. And then many smart cities connected to the grid by the power company that gives you a smart grid. So to grow from smart building all the way to the smart grid, you cannot do from top to bottom. That is how I see things are happening. So finally, going forward, the takeaways, I'm gonna spend a lot of time here because those have been talked about, relay capabilities, equipment update for reverse power flow, demand response, just talked about this. Uh, how does the large amounts of solar and wind create operation problems? Talked about this already. What I've seen like in San Francisco and some other areas, San Diego also, mid morning about 10 o'clock when the fog burns off in, in the winter time or even summertime as, as well, PV goes up output suddenly goes up. And this goes up, demand in that building or the house is not enough to use all the PV. So what happens? Voltage goes up. And that is a challenge that power company has to face to maintain the voltage in the US. The regulation is plus minus 5% is allowed outside that band. The power company can may have to pay fines. So how you deal with this, that's where you talk about smart inverters. As the output voltage begins to go up, it will cut down on the output of the inverter so that it, it is not pushing 100% of the, of the uh, PV to the feeder line. Less, this has to happen. Talked about G2V, V2G already. Finally, cross-border power transfer. If we can hook up globally as much as we can, now we have cross-border transfer between Canada, U.S. quite a bit, in Europe extensively, Denmark and Norway is a good example, Middle East, Gulf countries, and a little bit on the Asian side between China, Vietnam, and so on. India also, India does transfer it with uh, buying mainly Nepal and Bhutan. So that's what I see things happening from the big picture issues. But our focus in IEEE is help our members both corporations and individuals to decarbonize. IEEE has now a committee to set up IEEE policies and programs to help decarbonization. I chair that committee going forward. So a lot of things you'll see coming out of IEEE over time, but stay tuned, have faith in the system, we'll, we'll do all right. So this is it. On the right-hand side, I give my web address, srahman.org. And that's where I put this slide already. If you missed the slide, you can go to my website, srahman.org, and download these same slides. So I'm going to stop here for now. Ravi, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saifur. There are, again, I like this because it's raising questions for the other panelists. So the three takeaways I had from your session was telecom. And as you know, many in the utility would say that the telecom business really doesn't want the revenue of the utilities. It's so minuscule. They do far more business with the entertainment side and the downloading and videos, et cetera, that they would not want, in fact, to even get into the utility side with the high take up into this 5949 security systems. We in Canada, as you know, all the utilities have always owned their own telecom. So we are now talking of grid, cloud, all those things. So Ken, as you get to your turn, 
uh, something for you to sort of reflect. The second aspect. my insights into the fact that, um, uh, you know, as CEO of CMG, we have done probably about 40 smart grid roadmaps uh, since 2014. And now most recently over the last four years, I am driving a connected infrastructure consortium of research and development at Texas State University where we're building two significant labs. One is smart energy lab to do all kinds of research co-located with a 100 megawatt solar PV farm that is fronted by 40 megawatts of energy storage of multiple technologies. And then we're building a smart utility lab that is gonna crack the code on the digital substation of the future co-located with a 25 megawatt uh, solar PV farm as well and 10 megawatts of energy storage of multiple technologies. And so, you know, it's really fun uh, to have the ability to go back in time. And, you know, when I was at Austin Energy, uh, trying to dream up of this smart grid uh, reality, we, you know, wrote down all these details of what that grid of the future would look like, distributed, interactive self-healing and that it would communicate with every device and i think of all these things the hardest thing that was going to take us to achieve is the self-healing element and removing the human being in the control room and trusting the computers to do the right thing and i think that's going to be a very long and daunting uh step uh and, and so, you know, this picture was created uh, by ABB sometime in 2006. Um, and, uh, and obviously, is the, they're all to the new. And, you know, this is a rendition of the systems and the legacy architecture that Austin Energy had at, when I joined the company in 2003. And this, for the most part, having done 40 smart grid roadmaps is what most utilities still look like. It is a very complicated point to point integration with incredible amounts of single points of failure. Uh, and obviously what you want to do is evolve to an architecture that is holistically integrated 
and obviously, you know, uh, it was covered already by Manny and others, the notion of the IT bus and the OT bus. And I would argue that the OT bus has multiple elements and multiple buses, depending on centralized energy, renewable energy, and DER energy being managed at different time scales. And so that's probably the other thing that is going to be super complicated to resolve in many geographies, uh, let alone the fact that, you know, as, as you all probably know incredibly well, the mathematics, the differential equations needed to balance the grid real time, quote unquote, real time, sub milliseconds speed, it's not there. Uh, and, and the systems to do it is not, are not there. So we need to really re-architect all these things. But a couple of things that are really important that I think everybody is striving for. And I would say the first thing is that every utility needs to really finish the job of what I call Smart Grid 1.0 in my book, that is really integrating the, the utility infrastructure, all of it, right? All the systems of the utility finally integrated with telecom, with all the you know, necessary uh, resolutions of co conflicts and disaster recovery and business continuity and all this thing. And that journey remains, right? But what you see on the right side of the screen is really the challenge where we're heading into, right? Is the customer systems, is the things that need to be integrated by the utility to make sure that all those customer systems can participate in the balance of the grid at 60 hertz. And so the challenge is, how do we do that? How do we, how do we, you know, eventually overcome the notion that, you know, customers want autonomy? Do you have a market system where they can walk away from the commitment and the delivery? Or do you have a load control system that the utility has total monopoly on the HIC 60 hertz? How do you resolve that when you have tens of thousands of millions of devices at the edge of the grid, eye landing or coming back to, for synchronization in all kinds of speeds, uh, you know, near, near real time, real time, so on and so on. And so to me, it's really about the lessons learned and what it looks like. You know, I also uh, have been teaching a class at Texas State on building a smart grid architecture for five years now. And uh, obviously you all know Texas and, and the sophistication of the grid in Texas, even though we were uh, incredibly hammer and humble in January, February of last year, when our Snowmageddon. Uh, but I would say that the four bullets here are, you know, have been covered. And the key is that, you know, private networks, not carrier-based networks, not commercial networks, but it will be private networks uh, that will dominate and how these industrial systems will manage themselves and have the ability or perhaps the shot at being self-healing. You cannot really trust a commercial carrier in a commercial network to manage, you know, the Twitter traffic and the reliability of a substation at the same time. So it is really the notion of private 4G, private 5G, or the continuation of all these other technologies, that it will be there, it will be very difficult and expensive to replace them over time, as you all know. And that's the challenge. Affordability of the delivery of the service is really what gets in the way of throwing everything out and buying new gadgets overnight. And so it is an incredible you know, dance, an orchestrated dance of how you replace these systems. And when you talk about the, the challenge of embracing the customer systems, it's being covered, you know, all the things that are there, demand response, distributed energy resources, our plans, uh, you know, things like uh, conservation voltage, uh, or, you know, uh, in, in you know, vol bar controls and or vol bar optimization and microgrids and vehicle to grid and vehicle to X, 
And I think vehicle to x is something really fascinating. You probably all uh, saw the announcement by Ford Motor Company of the Ford 150 Lightning, which I put a down payment for one because I think it's amazing that I'm going to be able to run my house for four days uh, using my Ford 150 Lightning. And perhaps what's going to happen there, a lot of people will charge the truck at work for free and then come home and run the house and never pay electricity to the utility. So the load curve there could be a, a wacky experiment of how this is all going to evolve. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, it was also covered uh, that um, this notion of the power grid in the U.S. Uh, will need to have a lot more uh, generation as we uh, electrify the transportation sector. And I would do the math for you real quick. There are 280 million registered vehicles in the U.S. If we assume for a moment, just fantasizing, that they all had a 100 kilowatt hour battery, that would be 28,000 gigawatts of power needed uh, if they were all going to charge at the same time. Obviously, they're not going to charge at the same time. They'll be scheduled. But I don't think it's four times what's needed. I think it's going to be more like 10 or 15 times what's needed as the electrification of the uh, vehicles happen. And so the notion of turning any energy source is a is a, a fait accompli. It's a bad idea because there is not enough power to juice up the entire sector if we're serious about decarbonizing the planet. And so lots of challenges there. Uh, we also talked about uh, the change of spinning machines to inverter-based generation. And so we need to create virtual inertia. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on that front uh, and uh, by several fellows. Uh, and uh, and then the migration, in my opinion, of what we, I would call direct current uh, wiring and, and functionality at the premise level, at the building level, and at the microgrid level, away from AC, uh, to enable a different architecture and easier eye landing and throttling of the power and the voltages. Uh, and obviously, you know, it was also covered by many uh, in most of these things, but the topic of the SCADA EMS and ADMS systems and really the, their inability to move to the future. And so I've always discussed the notion of something that I call the smart grid optimization engine. Again, a system of systems that really integrates not only the SCADA and the EMS and ADMS functionality uh, to enable you know, all this edge uh, sophistication and needs, but all the challenge of uh, integrating into things like AI and machine learning and so on. And so ultimately, you know, enabling the notion of this self-healing, real-time synchronization, dynamic eye landing of virtual power plants, right? And so embracing and creating the virtual power plant, basically the optimization of megawatts and megawatts dynamically, right? As we turn things to balance the grid at any given moment. And so so this is uh, it's quite a journey that is ahead of us. I see many countries and many utilities putting the stake on the ground of being decarbonized by 2030, 2040, 2050. And I think that the, our job just has gotten incredibly more secure but also the bar to meet the demands of the job have gone up a hundredfold. And so with that, I send back my uh, congratulations to all, all of you for being leaders on this sector. And uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. I think there were two sort of themes that came up from your talk. One is the notion of self-healing of microgrids, the ability to come on. I'm reminded of the IEEE 2030 committee of the T1, T2, T3, T4 isolations and reconnects. But you know what? I've had the distinct pleasure of failing seven microgrid controllers in my lifetime. In fact, I'm not liked by many. And the reason is very simple. They're all energy controllers for optimization of fuel balance. They are not power system controllers. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking here is power system control. And yet we constantly keep moving to the energy side of the world 
Uh, and so it doesn't do any service to the network, if you will. So that's one thing. The second you talked about virtual inverter uh, inertia, uh, actually we in the power system side are asking for more in enhanced power in the inverters so that we can take care of both war and inertia. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is like trying to build more than needed, which is in some way not a return on asset for the asset uh, IPP. So it, it goes cross purposes here. So I just raise that again as two themes and maybe when we get to the tough area, somebody else can answer it. So thank you very much for that. Before I move on to the heavy hitting speakers, uh, I want to bring in Andrew Dicker here. I haven't heard anybody talk of investments. I haven't had anybody talk about, you know, how easy is this to do this cakewalk? And so I'm going to bring in Andrew Dicker. I don't know whether you're planning to cover this, Andrew, but it'll be good if you did. And by the way, Adarsh Nagarajan sends his regrets. He's got a family emergency, so he will not be joining us today. So over to you, Andrew. And thank you. And you'll have to forgive me. My voice is breaking. I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. I don't have any slides today, uh, so I'll, I'll try and be brief. Uh, for a little context on my background, I'm, I'm a managing director with Accenture. I've worked with, uh, with 10 to 15 utilities across North America uh, in uh, developing mul multiple hundred million dollar investment programs, uh, tending to, towards all of the different types of capabilities we've been discussing today. Uh, so things like OMS programs, DMS programs, distribution automation, how it all connects in, uh, and, and very broadly, you know, the, the way that uh, the, the, the construct works for investments in the U.S., uh, be, as, as monopolies, there, there's a lot of regulatory pressure. Uh, there's a lot of focus in uh, engaging with uh, regulatory bodies to talk about the benefits, both in qualitative and quantitative terms. There's been an increasing focus on those benefits uh, not only being benefits to uh, the utility in terms of uh, cost reductions, but also in terms of uh, what is the value to customers in terms of uh, helping them monetize uh, some of the services that they provide to the grid, as well as some of their uh, energy savings uh, that they can experience from things like uh, uh, distributed intelligence on smart meters and, and things of that like. But increasingly, there's also a big focus on societal benefits. Uh, what, what is the benefit of, um, say, job creation or clean water or emissions reductions? And all of these are, are coming together holistically. So there's a big focus on that as we're, as we're going to market. Uh, but you know, the, the one thing that I would, I would circle back around is, is really the, the, the biggest element of this paradigm shift of how we need to think about the grid. And the one thing, you know, I, I've been working in this space for about 10 or 15 years, my esteemed colleagues here, a lot of times when we talk about the grid, we have a tendency to think about it through the electrical engineering, to think about it through the control center. And that, that has been the way that this grid has always worked for 100 years. And I would like to challenge us to think about what is, what is the real change to this paradigm, right? When we think about EMS, when we think about smart meters, when we think about DMS, uh, so much of that is uh, what I refer to as a control and command paradigm, right? When the utility is monitoring and controlling in the control center, what is it monitoring and controlling? It's monitoring and controlling its own assets, and it's very easy to make a determination of controlling those assets when you own it. But in this emerging uh, paradigm where the grid acts as a platform to connect third parties, we've, we, we had in, in some of, uh, Andres was talking and, uh, uh, and, and Cypher was talking about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are huge. They need to be charged. We need to have this, this potential of vehicle to grid, but who owns those assets? They are not assets owned by the utility. So if we're going to try to monitor and control those assets, we now need to consider customer preferences because I promise you, 
and this is something that AI and ML is going to have a really hard time, right? If I'm going to try and get into my electric vehicle at eight o'clock in the morning to drive to work in hopefully a post-COVID world, uh, I want that vehicle to be charged. And if my utility has discharged my my vehicle in a vehicle to grid scenario overnight and I try and get in my car and it's got no juice, then holy crap, as a customer, I'm going to... I'm going to unenroll from that program and the customer is never going to see me again or the utility is never going to see me again. So this is really an opportunity as we're thinking about this, about the changing paradigm of how do we as, as the utilities monitor control, but also be partners with these, these third parties, these residential customers, these CNI customers, to take into account their preferences so we truly are acting as, as partners as we move forward. It's an opportunity that we need to seize now because if we try and re wake up and realize this and seize this in five or 10 years, the opportunity is going to be lost. So that, that's all I have to say today. It's, it's great to talk amongst my, my peers here and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You raise a good point. That is, how does a utility transform itself to energy as a service provider? And I'm not sure that touches into the regulatory space. Uh, if we had somebody from regulator, maybe Luciano at some point, you can reflect on that or Mark, you can reflect on that. The question truly is, is what do we do to what we leave behind in the public exchequer and the ratepayers uh, asset class as defunct and move into a new model, which is as a service provider. And, and maybe that is the question uh, which needs to be addressed. I'm going to bring in India now. Uh, okay, I think India has re re sort of listened very patiently to what the rest of the world is saying. And I'm eager to hear what Subir Sen does. He sort of, you know, India has got one of the largest transmission and one of the best transmission in the world. And, and they've done it almost all on their own. And, and so the question I think is, how does India perceive all this? I mean, we see the prime minister's statement in the climate change. He has talked about actually how do you bring in cost sharing in the new technologies. But yet at the same time, you know, how do you operate the system? Uh, you know, when Luciano talks about, you know, the supervising TSO, the TSO and then the DSO and maybe one other in the retail end as per Mani's uh, maybe uh, sketches. How does all that come together when we mush transmission and distribution together, as Anjan pointed out. So I'm, I'm eager to hear you, Sameer, as to what your thoughts are, what is the thought of India, as you hear all of us talk about all this. Uh, thank you, uh, Ravi. Uh, good evening and good morning. Uh, I have not uh, prepared uh, any slides for today's uh, deliberations. But uh, I can throw some lights about the Indian perspective in this direction. As you all know that the Indian grid is continuously evolving also because of the accelerated pace of energy transition in the form of increased penetration of the renewable capacity, mainly coming through the solar and wind. Now, the capacity addition through the conventional uh, coal-based generation is keep on reducing. And the other side, the solar and wind capacity addition is keep on increasing. So this is the number one. Number two, the focus is also to increase the electricity uses in the final energy consumption. So as uh, some of our previous panelists also highlighted that the demand is keep on increasing. It may go four times in the next one or two decades time. So similarly, because of the more and more final energy consumption is envisaged to be made through the electricity, the demand is evidently increased. Number three is that since we are extending the electricity connection to all the uh, uh, households or all the establishments, 
so the demand is also increasing that is the 100% electrification all the households all villages all the establishments are now electrified so the demand is also increasing at the same time the focus is also given towards the energy efficiency because we are believing not only that the uh, the planning has to be done based upon the demand driven also has to be done through the supply driven which uh, the sulfur rahman has also highlighted so the lot of focus has been given towards the energy conservation reduction in the energy intensity and collectively the energy efficiency part now the uh, since the renewable uh, resources mainly the solar and the wind the good quality solar irradiance and the good quality winds are not distributed across the country they are confined to the few locations like what was happening in the conventional generation like coal and hydro earlier days so the the two types of uh, uh, capacity addition program is going on one is the large scale renewable to bring the economies of a scale another is also the distributed uh, generation coming at the 11 kv or 415 volt or the even the lower voltage level like this so both types of capacity addition in, uh, renewables through the solar is happening wind is obviously coming in the large scale uh, in the large uh, capacity so transmission is also playing a big role because the waste land at the large scale uh, solar or wind can be installed are far off from the demand centers so we have the program like ultra mega solar uh, capacity where the station is having the 2000 megawatt 3000 megawatt capacity so it needs a huge land so those waste land and inferior quality waste land are far off from the demand center so we have to build the long distance transmission infrastructure at the same time to to enhance the capacity utilization of the transmission infrastructure we are now integrating the grid scale battery and or the energy storage systems in the uh, grid furthermore there are uh, renewable energy management centers have been established so that the intermittency and variability into the grid can be addressed to a large extent in the very co-located with the existing load dispatch centers in the various control zones the another important aspect is that we are broadening or extending the grid connectivity with our neighbors so that the balancing areas can be uh, widened to facilitate increased penetration of the renewables in an accelerated pace and we have already established the cross-border interconnections with our neighbors like bhutan nepal bangladesh and myanmar of capacity the power transfer which can happen is around 4200 megawatt and many more such cross-border links are under planning or construction stages which will enhance the capacity in a progressive manner as far as the grid operation is concerned our the the central uh, system operator posoko is managing the entire national grid and the state levels are managing by the respective state load dispatch centers now since we are considering the the lot of uh, penetration from the variable but volatile renewable generation projects the supply side management demand side management flexibility is of very much important so lot of focus has been given towards the bringing the new technology into the transmission as well as the distribution side in the form of the intelligent grid in the form of the self filling grid at the uh, the the sophisticated grids can monitors and controls and anticipate and instantly respond to the system problems so that we can avoid or mitigate the power pro power related problems and the power quality problems power outage problem because our motto is 
to provide round the clock uninterrupted quality power supply at the affordable price to each and every consumers so that is the basic purpose and for that the lot of um, uh, programs are going on reform process are going on uh, the, there are there are reform policies have been uh, introduced uh, into the uh, system also the focus is given to secure the physical and the cyber threat against the cyber threat because since the lot of computation technologies control and more and more automation and digitalizations are being integrated into the distribution and the transmission segment so cyber physical uh, threat and uh, mitigations uh, is also given the lot of uh, focus in this uh, direction the another important aspect is that we are creating a grid which is having a high interoperability with the rich support of the information and the operational technology so that it can allow the multiple networks systems devices as well as the other components the exchange of information in an efficient manner and with a minimum uh, human intervention so that focus is also given so that the the architecture which we are envisaging will be changed for the two way communications as well as the power flow so that can be easily uh, easily achieved the we are we are also giving lot of focus towards the protection mechanisms that protection at the distribution level the the transmission level is uh, is lot of protection systems are there including the system integrated protection schemes special protection schemes but similarly the distribution side because since it will be a bidirectional consideration of the power as well as the communication so protection uh, side is given lot of emphasis the another most important area is the demand response we can thought of the demand exchange where the customer can respond with the bid for demand reductions and receive financial compensation in return so that we can protect the grid grid stability security and resiliency can be maintained for any operating condition so this is the another area uh, which can be thought of uh, in these directions the investment uh, because already uh, we have launched our government has launched the program like a uh, reform based distribution sector improvement or revamp distribution sector schemes are around 40 billion dollar is uh, is an envisaged that outlay uh, over the period of the next 5 years similarly we have the national uh, infrastructure pipeline in plan which also envisaged lot of uh, investment in the power uh, power uh, in and the, also the renewable also that is a huge uh, sum is also envisaged because it needs lot of investment to make the system not only reliable but resilient robust at the same time if the consumer uh, should be empowered and make them the active uh, player in this entire energy management system last but not the least is that there are lot of regulatory reforms have been introduced to 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 facilitate quick adoption of the renewables along with the energy storage systems also to enable the electric vehicle penetration our target is by the year 2030 30% of the new early uh, sold uh, elect uh, vehicle will be the electric vehicle so the infrastructure will be required there are uh, charging infrastructure now we are talking about the battery swapping also especially for the two wheeler three wheeler type so the things are required is the standardized power and the communication interfaces which will allow the customer to interconnect the Uh, fuel cells renewable generation other distributed generation on a simple things the another important area which we are now working upon is the hydrogen uh, energy storage systems because lot of renewables are coming so uh, they instead of backing down the conventional generation which are otherwise also required in the evening time so uh, the, the 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 ultra super critical uh, type of technologies so those things are there but but we are now talking about the hydrogen uh, green hydrogen and the policy has also uh, formulated and that has been issued to enable the more and more 
uh, hydrogen production in the form of green hydrogen that means using the renewable energy as the uh, electricity for these things and uh, mm, as i already told the lot of focus has been given to make the system protection from the physical not only from the physical attack also from the cyber attack also so this is in a, in a brief about the uh, development which is happening uh, here uh, in line with the uh, requirement in line with the decarbonization effort which is also targeted uh, in this case and also there because of the regulatory provisions because of the grid code there are a lot of transparencies are there especially suppose my renewable is getting cuttle why it has been cuttle why i am getting continuously cuttle all these things have been clearly brought out because of the uh, the uh, enrich uh, renewable uh, mechanisms are also there and for the uh, cross border interconnections there are cross border regulations are also in place now the cross border transaction is happening in the bilateral uh, long term contract basis the market has gradually now picking up and then also the regulation allows for the multilateral uh, transactions also so uh, at the end i will just stop by uh, these uh, views on this that focus is given towards making the grid as a self healing uh, type of things with the integration of more and more automation and digitalization supported by the conducive policy and regulatory framework and uh, and also the uh, energy storage and even now we are talking that the electric uh, heating especially for the cooking type uh, this thing so how to manage these things and the challenges we are addressing so thank you very much i will stop here uh, thank you thank you subir there were two things you brought up i think one is the strategy of india to interconnect its transmission so effectively to be able to export renewable from one part of the country to another part of the country during surplus times so which is almost similar to what you did with coal where the eastern side was able to feed the western side on the load center so that was one takeaway the second is the notion that you have you need something for demand efficiency or a demand control as opposed to just energy control and i think some where some way we need to probably articulate this a little better is to how do we put demand controllers such that they become automatically controlling at certain other nodes as opposed to making it a central load balancing problem uh, because that at some point would have to be distributed as well so those were the two takeaways so thank you very much for this we'll now move Levis, on to yeah let me sir will interrupt for a minute uh, maybe uh, we may overrun by a few minutes so if somebody has a commitment because it's a uh, uh, us and uh, north america it's morning time office time starting if uh, somebody drop out we, before that we would like to have a group photo so we would request everybody to this is a dream panel as you would agree so would like to have a picture with everybody please switch on your cameras and come online technical team please take a picture uh, professor rahman yeah uh, who is missing andrew, andrew yeah, andrew, yeah. Yeah, we have everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. See how life, life changed. <laughs> and in last one week, how the world is changed or going to change. <laughs> we used to stand together at ISUW and take a picture <laughs> in the past. We hope those days will come soon. And look forward to hosting you all in Delhi. Except, I guess, uh, uh, Andrew Ginder and, sorry, uh, yeah, Andrew Dicker and uh, Kenneth, all others been here in ISUW. Lu yeah. oh, oh, Luciano, you where, where are you? I, I can't find Luciano. Ah, yeah, okay. Number one. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank Without you. Luciano, Thank you. we can't take a picture. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. See you all. Back to you, you. Revi, sir. Yeah, so I think we won't be more than 10 minutes. I think uh, we, we've got three speakers, very interesting perspectives they will provide. Uh, and I think it may be about 10 minutes to Q&A. So we may run over 10 to 15 minutes uh, with your permission, Reggie. So I'm going to now call upon Luciano. I think, Luciano, you sit with the EU perspective. And EU does things differently. It has made its mistakes sometimes, but it leads the world in certain other areas. 
And today, the largest microgrid in the world, not by its choice, is Ukraine, having got cut off from the Russian intertime. So, you know, talking of geographic dispersions, also sometimes we have a problem. So today, it's, it has not been able to connect to the EU grid because you have not allowed it permission or the tests. And yet it has been cut off from the Russian grid and therefore the largest microgrid in the world today is Ukraine. So, uh, Luciano, uh, eager to hear your views. I know you have many slides, but if you can point to a few, that will be good. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm, I'm very much eager to contribute to the discussion. And I uh, thank you for inviting me as uh, ISGAN chair to share my view, of course, uh, mainly based on Europe situation, according to the moderator inputs. Uh, my life will not be much easier because most of the distinguished speakers before already touched upon all the important aspects. I can tell you that I have a feeling that we are what we are talking about are global challenges. So Europe doesn't make any difference with the other. Of course, global challenges that need the local solution. So local solutions are needed because the energy mix is different, because the grid topology is different, because also the connection is there. Yes, Europe made some very good progress, also based on some uh, failure, also because we know that from past event, we need to reinforce our system. As you know, ENSOE is grouping all the, uh, nearly all the transmission system operator in Europe. This makes our system stronger and stronger. Nevertheless, uh, it's just uh, uh, improving over the years because we include the new technology, new algorithm, new possibility to control in real time. You know, Europe is small, but it's, it's still at the same size as maybe as India, so we have facing similar um, challenges as you to make sure that we can dispatch energy when in a, in a certain region to another region where the load is asking for such an energy. So maybe what I would like to stress in my contribution is the importance of international cooperation, is in the importance of sharing best practices and uh, key exploitable results. As I said, we need a local solution. Nevertheless, some of the results, some of the innovative solutions we put in place in Europe, elsewhere in the world, can be replicated successfully in other places. So accelerating the innovation, accelerating the clean energy transition that will make our system around the world more decarbonized and having a, a, like a, a less foot, a carbon footprint in our economy. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to show a, a few slides just to tell you uh, what we believe uh, is, a, is a quite important about uh, collaboration. I, I know that uh, you are aware about ISGAN. ISGAN is a, 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 an international, uh, is a global platform with experts. So we share the same needs, RNI needs and also we share what is already available as a result of innovative solution. India is on board, is a very important member of ISCAN, as well as many others you see on this map. Uh, I want to say that we analyze the important trends, some of them have been already recalled by the other speakers. So why our system need to change, to accommodate which challenge? And the main trends are the ones that we talk already along this plenary. So the decarbonization uh, of our system, our economy, so they need for a massive integration of renewables in our system with all the challenges associated to their intermittency. And there is also a trend that is quite peculiar for Europe, but I think is also quite well known elsewhere, that is to put the customer at the center, to give a role to the customer, to consider the final customer as like a, one of the player, one of the actors of a system, to provide new functionality, to provide new possibility to access to data, to better use and consume the energy. And then something that was recalled by the other speaker, electrification of everything, electrification of transport, electrification of end use. This is also to increase efficiency, but of course, posing challenges on our system because you need, by electrifying those systems, to increase the availability of energy uh, in this uh, very efficient form that is electricity. We also consider the possibility of support from the hydrogen economy, but this is still to come when the, the challenges are already in front of us. So we have really to advance faster on the electrification side. Another important aspect that we 
of course, consider is the increase in demand for flexibility in our system, the increased demand for resilience to our system due to very catastrophic events, severe events, and also what a new trend, an important trend that is seen the situation as a systems of system when the backbone is made by the electricity system but with all the connection with the other energy vector energy vector means uh, for transportation the the building sector the waste sector and so on of course we also consider that we are still under a pandemic uh, situation so the recovery is important and then we find an holy grade that is digitalization. Digitalization of our system already progress very much. And digitalization make it possible to control and automate uh, many different uh, assets in the system to communicate from each other. And of course, uh, digitalization also call for interoperability of the system, the possibility to exchange data with a good uh, data platform that allowed the different actor to assess those data. But of course, challenges, because not only the number of assets is increasing, but also the number of actors, involved actors, active actors are, is increasing. And this, of course, poses some challenges uh, to the system and to the operators. This is just to, for you to, to give a number. Italy is a small country, especially if compared to India, but we face really an increased number of generation units. So we move from a few hundred of larger generator plants to a, really a huge number, more than 1 million today, of uh, uh, generation unit, mainly from PV, so uh, rooftop PV, for example. And this means also a large observability is needed for our system in order to make uh, the proper control. In this slide, maybe you recognize uh, several uh, things that has been mentioned by the other speakers. So uh, the greater importance of uh, uh, agree on the needed grid architecture the bidirectional flow of energy, the system of observability and the need for extra flexibility of our system, the V, the transition and important aspect and important role that will be played by electric vehicle because of smart charging vehicle to grid, but also because of a future vehicle to grid increase in contribution. And of course, storage. Storage is, is of course, it's something that needs to be developed. It's still too expensive, it's still uh, under R&I, but we have already very practical solution that has been implemented in real life. The importance of data, the importance of being having an approach that put the customer at the center. And something that was uh, also recalled is something related to market design and the uh, innovation and the new business uh, opportunity. Maybe I can take now uh, your question about regulatory framework. This is also very important. When we talk about innovation, everything to, need to advance at the same pace, not only technology, not only the market design, but also regulatory aspect. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the Italian regulator is very open to innovation. Uh, of course, uh, still keeping uh, all the aspect under control. And then, for example, we have launched very recently some pilot project to really focus on ancillary services to be provided to the system and that pilot are involving system operator aggregator all the actors from the system to uh, to validate innovative solution in order to really come up with some deliberation that uh, take into account those results and put forward the right remuneration for those services if not nobody will be providing those services to the to the system I'm almost coming to the end and I would like to say that uh, international cooperation is key. That's why at ISGAN we really uh, uh, established a very strong partnership with many key initiatives. You see some of the logo here. I want to mention the Global Smart Energy Federation. We work together. We have a joint award every year. We work with all these players in order really to share innovative solutions that can be readily and steadily implemented in our system. I think I would like to stop here. I give you back the floor and I'm ready to contribute to any of the other further discussion. Thank you, Ravi, for this opportunity. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Two takeaways, I think. And EU, by the way, has got some distinct benefits and characteristics. It has actually done it very well. First is energy aggregators are perhaps the best success stories that have emanated from EU. We have failed in North America, we have failed in Asia, and we have failed in other parts of the world where the utility has not been able to be seen as the openness of the energy aggregator. 
So you look at the network operating center, you look at demand response, you look at everything, the transparency that Mani talked about in his slides, uh, somehow Europe has got that and, and the rest of us are struggling with the so-called linear control system. The second is the architecture being a three-phase retail architecture, including residences, helps them in every way which does not help North America. We have a two-phase system here. And I can tell you for those all who are charging L2 at home on the electric vehicles in North America, if you have three homes that are on the same phase, you will not be able to charge at the same time. Uh, it's because of the unbalance that takes place on the retail secondary conductors. You will not be able to manage it the way we they manage it in the EU, simply because of the architecture. And the third, of course, is the network interconnections, right? The Western Europe is so nicely interconnected across many fossils, hydroelectric, atomic energy, and so on. They're able to use each other as a battery bank, which we have not been able to, despite all the interconnections we talk about. They are not, in my view, functional interconnections as Europe has done. Europe has done it very well. So those are the three takeaways I had, Luciano, from your uh, talk. And we will uh, articulate this perhaps uh, in our Q&A. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to turn the floor over to Mark. Mark, uh, you have worked uh, as EPRI, in fact, in many, many projects. Uh, with perhaps a flair of what the world is doing as well. Uh, you, I've been a part of your committees when I was in the utility. And the question is the practicalness of what can be and what cannot be done and how are you going about uh, recommending these various roadmaps? So over to you. Okay, Ravi, thank you very much. And this truly is a superstar uh, panel. So I'm glad we got a good picture of it because uh, very difficult to bring these experts together. I, I really enjoyed the discussion so far, and uh, I'll try to focus on just a couple of um, aspects of the architecture that have already been discussed, but I'll try to reinforce a couple of those. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> and we've already talked about the fact that the grid of now and especially the grid of the future where we have more and more renewables many of them distributed we have um to electrify everything as luciano just just said um and, and we have to really put the customer and the community at the center of all that and that's one of the things i'm going to emphasize that it does require some significant thinking about the architecture this is a high level diagram from a Salt River project roadmap, you know, just emphasizing the different use cases that will come up as we define the requirements for the architecture, integrating microgrids, integrating customers that have electric vehicle charging and storage and PV um, communities that bring those customers together. And all of that has to work, um, work together to operate and optimize the grid and one of the things that we're seeing over and over again is um that the customer is needs to be at the center of this and you know hawaii went through a lot of iterations on their roadmap and strategy to really come to realize this and and build everything in their future roadmap around that concept and including concepts like equity and customer preferences and how they fit into the community and and uh building the grid to take that into account. So I'm going to emphasize that role of the customer. We put together a video a number of years ago, we called the shared integrated grid, just to illustrate, you know, the concept of the customer participating in the in the management and operation of the grid. And what that does is it, it then uh, illustrates the requirements for an architecture and a platform to make that happen. So I'm going to use two examples here. One's from Southern California Edison, and, and uh, I think it, uh, I think the Southern California Edison example illustrates a concept that uh, that, that Andres um, put out there, and and we heard right from the beginning that we need to have a a uh, OT bus and an IT bus, you know, th they call it enterprise domain and a grid controls domain. And, uh, and, and that's very important. And, and we're going to see that. Um, but we have to have exchanges of information between those two domains. And it has to work seamlessly. 
And I think a concept that Ravi that you brought up is also critical and that we're going to, and, and Andres did saying that we're probably going to have multiple OT buses. And, you know, the question is, what do we do as things from those kind of uh, that are shown of distributed resources that tie in through um, public infrastructure to the enterprise bus? And when we have to move those to the OT bus, you know, what happens when we need to control energy storage and make sure, make it part of our actual operations? Does it move over to the OT side and do we need a different controller? It changes communication networks. What happens when we want electric vehicle charging stations for fleets and for fast charging to be controlled in the in the OT side of the equation? You know, how does that change the requirement for those technologies? So we have this kind of architecture, but it's a moving target in terms of which side of that equation some of these technologies need to fall on. So let's keep that in mind as 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 we uh, go forward in defining the architecture. And then finally, you know, looking at a European example um, from in a, in a project that's going on here in Europe called the OneNet project. And I don't know if this is the one Luciano was referring to, pro probably not, because there's many projects going on like this. But this is a project that's uh, hopefully it brings together TSOs and DSOs working together to kind of define the architecture that that we need to make all of this work. And, and it's the same principle of, you know, system management and the OT side of the equation operating somewhat in a traditional manner, but with much more data and communications and, and uh, you know, as, as we heard, communicating to every device on the system, but with our own communication infrastructure that operates on the OT side. And then working through APIs or other interfaces to platforms that maybe are operated by an electric vehicle charging vendor, or maybe are operated by a PV inverter system or an energy storage uh, operator like Sonin or something. They each have platforms and we're gonna need to interface to their technology through those platforms with appropriate APIs. And here in Europe and probably uh, also in, in the US eventually, we need to make all this work in a market manner and a, and a fair market approach. And so that adds another level of complexity to the architecture that we can't have all of these devices just are under our control. We have to build a market structure to have interaction around value and prices and figure out how to, how to translate those value and prices into um, market offerings and then have participation of, of all of these distributed devices. So a lot of the concepts that, that we've already heard, but I wanted to kind of emphasize those couple of, of options of the, the two different aspects of integration of these technologies that we've heard already. Another, uh, another uh, important aspect that when we look at this Southern California Edison example that, that really is critical is the modular structure of implementing new applications. And that requires standards around data interfaces and, and data design so that we can plug in new capabilities to that operation service bus or that enterprise service bus and make them work seamlessly. So the modular structure and the, and the um, kind of data interchange specifications that go with those are also absolutely critical for this architecture of the future. And I think I'll just leave it there um, as a couple of important points to emphasize and ones we've already heard, but uh, it's, it's important to continue to, to emphasize them. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, bef before I get to our last in the heavy hitting uh, subject that I wanted to bring in, I'm going to ask the organizers if they can sort of bundle questions together so that we could be ready for Q&A. But Ken, there was a reason why I kept you last, and it's because of the heaviness of the subject that you bring for all of us. You are the holder of the bag, the telecom bag, and everything that we talk about has to sort of flow through your network. So I, I would like to talk, get you to talk about how do you see our world evolving through your solutions? So over to you, Ken.
We can't hear you. You're muted. Bobby, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I will be talking about the, the communications infrastructure. And I want to separate communications from communication service providers. I, let's look at how what we need to do to be able to connect all these devices, um, all of these new markets that we're going to be creating to, to trade energy. Um, uh, what what are the capabilities that we need, and, and how do we how do we need to start start building them? Um, so, uh, other speakers have talked about the, the challenge that lies in front of us. So, at the same time, we're incorporating these highly intermittent sources of renewable energy into the grid, and many times in in very distributed fashions. At the same time, we've got all of that variability and the need for tighter control and more state information. We also are electrifying huge portions of the economy, um, transportation, uh, 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 tra uh, construction, et cetera. Um, we, are, we have not seen a transition like this as fast as we are having uh, in the electric utility world uh, as we are having now and over the next decade. And the communications being able to measure, monitor, and control, understand at many different time scales and many different dynamics what is happening at the grid, being able to experiment, bring in uh, new applications uh, at rates we have never done before. Um, uh, we are, are entering a, a, a world where communications are going to be even more essential than they are uh, today. Um, and also, we are entering a world where we better make sure that these communications are available ahead of the need in order to be able to, to make this transition happen. Our world is counting on us. Um, so a lot of speakers have talked about the, the big changes. Um, just want to highlight what this means for um, our infrastructures. Um, if we are not able to control this, if we have to invest more into capital infrastructure to uh, replace things that are already uh, in the ground, that is going to be a huge investment. So building this uh, nervous system, uh, improved nervous system into the grid will allow us controls and mechanisms to sweat these he heavy capital assets. And that's an essential part of keeping energy affordable throughout the, throughout the grid. And in order to do this, we need to be able to put sensors, devices anywhere that's needed. Uh, we need to also provide uh, controls and monitoring uh, that has uh, very low latency, lots of high rel reliability. Uh, we are moving to a world that, that doesn't exist uh, today in, in many parts of the world. And there are three things we're going to need to do to make this world a reality. Uh, one is to digitize everything that matters. And everything that matters is also changing as we move to uh, incorporating storage uh, and more, more generation. Um, we also need to be able to provide that information in a reliable and secure way um, uh, and share network infrastructures to keep things keep things uh, uh, cheap and, and affordable and easy to manage. And we're also, uh, many speakers have talked about moving to this world of AI analytics, everything, everything data. Um, that is a, a, a different type of communications paradigm that we're, and we're typically uh, living in in many utilities throughout the world. Many devices need to be connected. Most of those devices are out in distribution grid. Distribution grid is the place where most utilities in the world today uh, either have very, very poor eyesight or are completely blind. Um, this is uh, in order to be able to um, uh, incorporate new business models, be able to um, add uh, storage, um, add uh, generation. We have to be able to reach everything and anything out in the electric grid. And that's going to mean seriously um, uh, beefing up our uh, private uh, wireless and private wireline networks uh, in order to be able to provide the mission critical connectivity um, that is out, um, out in, in distribution. Also um, uh, mentioned, we are seeing this move to highly distributed architectures and, and hierarchical architectures for grid control. I think this is a trend that is going to be with us for uh, the next several decades. It's the only way that we can control at the scale we need to control and monitor and manage at the cons uh, way, way we are today. That means uh, instead of all of our um, control uh, going back to a SCADA master in, in uh, some operations center, we have direct, uh, uh, direct communication between devices 
uh, and, and maybe uh, uh, applications running in substations, applications running in enterprises. That is a much different type of communication network than utilities use today. And we're gonna have to be building things differently. We're also going to need to be able to push processing closer and closer to the, to the, to the edge of the network, uh, closer and closer to the homes and enterprises uh, all along the distribution lines. And this is largely for reasons of reliability, but also reasons of delay. Um, we are going to be controlling things potentially at sub-cycle uh, timescales. Uh, and at those timescales, the speed of light starts to matter. Um, we are now, um, in order to reach devices out in the distribution grid, we are working across the globe to deploy today fourth generation wireless technologies to connect um, devices out in distribution grid, um, also in transmission grid, uh, and to provide this level of control and information that, that's needed. Um, these broadband wireless technologies support the bandwidths that are needed to control the grid and monitor the grid. Over time, we will also be introducing fifth generation wireless technologies. These are technologies that my colleagues and I are developing uh, today and standardizing so that it can be used globally. Um, these are going to be the wireless technologies that underpin the fourth industrial revolution. We're using these technologies to control robots, to control SCADA devices, uh, to control uh, uh, vehicles, um, extremely reliable wireless connectivity with fiber-like reliabilities and also extremely low latencies. So today with um, the fourth generation wireless technologies, we are deploying um, out in uh, with, with customers in electric grids, we're getting about 10 millisecond latencies or so. Um, when we start talking about teleprotection and distribution and being able to control at uh, sub-cycle timescales, there we need to be moving to this fifth generation world um, that will come eventually, uh, not, not uh, immediately, uh, for, for the electric grid, but uh, is, is coming. And then we also need to move our processing closer and closer to the user because uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, uh, correspond to milliseconds of delay. Uh, across the globe, um, utilities and other industrials are beginning to use fourth generation wireless networks to deploy their own private wireless networks or they're getting together and building consortiums of like-minded utilities to build this wireless nervous system at the level of security, reliability, and scalability that's needed for electric grid monitoring and control. Um, uh, out in California, uh, Southern Cal Edison, also uh, uh, SDG&E, had bought licenses of Spectrum to build their own private 4G networks to control uh, in the distribution grid. Um, interesting uh, other example is in Germany. Uh, 450 Connect is a consortium of electric utilities that got together, went to the regulator, and got a license for Spectrum for a nationwide mission critical operations network for grid control. The same thing is happening in Poland. This model, we believe, will, uh, will, uh, will grow because it is absolutely critical. Access to cheap, reliable energy underpins the gross domestic product and economies of every nation in the world. And this nervous system is essential to make this network, uh, the cost of energy low and also keep energy reliable as we continue to electrify major portions of economies. Um, good news is a lot of utilities are already in, in good stead uh, to begin to push this network um, that we're talking about uh, deeper and deeper into, uh, into the distribution grid, um, already have um, a substantial assets of fiber and microwave. This is the backbone that is interconnecting uh, substations, control centers, uh, major generation facilities. What's happening now is in this field area network, this is where fourth generation and fifth generation wireless technologies are being deployed to be able to reach everything and also do it at the speed that's needed. Anywhere a device is needed, turn it up and get it, get it operating. Uh, uh, and also as business models change, 
be able to get the information needed to um, support those new, new business models. Of course, everything is moving to this world of uh, digitalization and using finer and finer grained the digital state across the entire grid to control anything and everything. Um, and we're also moving to this world where devices are, and applications are gonna have more IT-like life cycles. So we're gonna have to use substantial automation in provisioning, uh, in, in bringing applications and security. Um, uh, automation is going to be essential to make all of this work. Fiber is going to be essential for all of this to work. And um, in, in uh, countries that have high renewable penetration, uh, utilities are pushing fiber deeper and deeper into their substations, uh, to, to enterprises. As that fiber gets built, that is also providing opportunities to bridge the digital divide uh, and also provide the re reliable connectivity that's needed for enterprises. Uh, we see also new business models emerging where utilities can potentially become uh, carriers of service for uh, communication service providers uh, and other entities. So um, just in, in closing, I, I wanna emphasize that um, all of this is happening very fast. And we as an industry have to help make it happen fast. Our, our, our planet and, and uh, our life depends on it. Um, these communication infrastructures don't happen overnight. It's essential that we start planning uh, where we're gonna push fiber deeper. Um, every utility in the world should be knowing about how they are going to reach assets out in the distribution grid. Um, and that also means engaging with regulators to uh, figure out how to make wireless technologies, 4G and 5G wireless technologies, part of this, 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 this whole uh, uh, control and, and uh, um, uh, management uh, uh, paradigm. And, and this doesn't happen off overnight people-wise either. There's a huge people side of this where um, we need to be developing uh, skills in our, our, our utilities where we have uh, uh, more and more of these IT-like uh, capabilities in order to support it. Um, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back, but thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. And thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Uh, like I said, uh, the best is always the last. Uh, so you are, in fact, the key person to many of our questions that we had. Uh, two things that I got from yours, and, and this may be actually a shout out to the rest of the power system guys. Your lowering of latency is actually being added by us by not having standards in the data transformation. We've got so many translates and this and that boxes that we've put out thanks to no standardization on the data architecture, that we are actually now beginning to look like the roughness on a smooth steel surface. Whereas you're getting faster and faster and faster, the QOS, QOS boxes and others are adding sometimes even 100, 200 millisecond latency just on the translate side. So that was one which probably affects us on our side. Second is as the aerial secondary conductors, this is to your fiber problem, we in Toronto and other, I sit on a couple of IEC committees. Uh, and as we, for tree contact purposes, we are moving into what's called actual conductors, aerial conductors on the secondary, so that the tree trimming doesn't have to be taken place uh, very, very frequently. We should be thinking, and I've been talking about that, as to whether to put a fiber there so that it becomes an incremental that we have on a conductor system, which is aerial, so that then you have that depth automatically. So Hydro-Quebec in some cases is sort of leaning more towards it, whereas the rest of the country has not because of some perceived notion. So it could very well be that the tree trimming program may allow us to put fiber on our secondary conductors for the very reasons that you talk about. So again, thank you very much to all. Now we'll open it up to questions. Uh, Reggie, if there are any questions, uh, the, the more you bundle it, the better, uh, so that we can sort of Close it in about 10 minutes. Yep, uh, we have about 100 people on the platform, but nobody asked any question. So it, <laughs> this, this is to uh, new or a, a technical subject that people uh, take time to grasp it. So there were no questions from the audience. Uh, some of the very knowledgeable people were on the audience, which I checked, but no, no, no questions they have posted. So it's yeah. between the between the experts and the moderator, you could, <laughs> and maybe maybe after going through all this, uh, 
uh, our team presenter uh, money uh, may like to develop on some other yeah, so what so what i am planning to do is i'll send you the notes that i prepared as a result of this instruct rearticulating it again and then you can present it in fact the fact that you said nobody asked any question i saw sunay there i thought he would ask a question um, is, that's what i said there are a lot of knowledgeable people <laughs> nobody yeah, asked so so it goes back to my iit days in kharagpur where we had very powerful professors and we never dare to ask a question professor menon and all the other i think anjali is smiling there so he probably <laughs> relates to these people we were scared we were scared of these professors so it could very well be this so the best way to do it is to put it in the form of a questionnaire and maybe you can float it in your ecosystem and i think it needs to be articulated what is india's road map right and i think that was the purpose we saw ganesh srinivasan give that talk we saw rajesh bansal all the utilities in india are saying i need a road map for me that is unique to me not what you preach elsewhere so i think we need to translate this so i think what i will do is i won't go back into any more discussion we are sort of 7 minutes over time i will close it now and then through the questions you can oh, yeah sorry anjan yeah there there was a question by mr sunay um on the chat and it was directed to me so i thought since, okay, sure. since nobody uh, else is talking out there he, he he asked about uh, how does this affect uh, the planning process and uh, i i my short uh, reaction is uh, you know planning is uh, is being done differently in different uh, countries different regions uh, but it is going to be one of the major issues coming up because that's where where you're going to put the new generation where you're going to put uh, uh, change the architecture uh, is is going to be the big issue i i think the 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 areas of the world which are going to do better in planning are of course the ones that do do this centrally you know so china being at one end where the whole country is planned at the same time and uh, um, you know uh, very, most countries are somewhere in between um, and and the us is on the other extreme where the ownership of the grid Uh, and generation is uh, takes thousands of owners who have to kind of coordinate to do uh, uh, do the planning and uh, and there is as uh, many of us on the uh, from north america know there is not a lot of coordination uh, uh, in in the planning space uh, each part of the eastern grid does its own planning Uh, and uh, and that also is now being jeopardized uh, by the fact that the generators have a lot of leeway in uh, making their own decisions it's completely deregulated so 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 there there there's a huge issue i think going back to the indian question i think the india has a nice uh, uh, top down i mean it's not uh, totally centralized because all the states come into play Uh, and uh, uh, with their own areas but uh, i think the the coordination provided by the central system is uh, is is uh, probably was going to help making those planning decisions easier thanks uh, ravi if i can if i can yeah. pull through dr bose's comments one of the things that we are finding as we work heavily across the united us and parts of europe and so on is that we really need to step back a little bit and say this is not about delivering electricity this is about delivering energy because if you are going to go to net zero if we are going to go to carbon neutral we have to think of electricity natural gas and all of these things together and one of the things that we are talking about and actually promoting very heavily is this concept of an energy agnostic planning so i'm just extending anjan's professor bose's comments pulling the string a little bit more because that energy agnostic planning becomes very important i'll give a great example uh, very close to where i live in redmond washington uh, everybody from fedex to usps to ups to microsoft they all have their uh, bus depots right i mean light commercial vehicles and so on and the reason i use that as an example is that they are all converting to electric 
So now this small set of depots were each taking a load of about 1.5 to 2 megawatts each are going to go to about 300 megawatts. Very important point to think through, right? Now, if I just go by the planning by the regular form, it's important to see that um, I would have just like raised the substations, put bigger wires, bring more generation and all that stuff. But if I think of it as an energy agnostic planning, I already have natural gas going in there. Can I use the natural gas to deliver electricity locally? And I'm using that as an example because that's a real practical example. So even in planning, we have to really truly transform ourselves. Doing it the old way is no longer adequate. I'll throw that back to you, sir. Okay, good. Actually, you know, there's a very fine example. Reji, uh, through his leadership, we led a project in the city of Calcutta where we were getting OEMs of buses giving 300 kilowatt hour buses batteries. And we were having to double every substation in the Calcutta electric system. But you know, we did an iterative service using root maps and 70% of the buses did not even need the batteries that they were coming with. They were selling us batteries that were not going to be used. So we have every battery and guess what? The entire ROI changed. Nothing on the utility side ever had to change by way of standards. All the connections, the connection codes, the tariff, no changes were done. And about now, I think 70 or 80 buses through the World Bank program is already rolled into Calcutta. So the point I'm trying to make is sometimes we have to challenge ourselves to go into a different domain to say that you are not efficient. And this goes back to Saifu's problem. Just, and then and therefore say, you know what? We would like you to reconsider as opposed to the OEM saying, I've got an F-150 pickup. This is what I have. You've got to put this charger and so be it, right? And that's the vertical silo mentality we have typically in North America and even in Europe, we have yeah. that. So, so I, I think that, that is, a, is an area that we need to look at energy as a horizontal and it may make people very uncomfortable, but so be it. And maybe Cypher, we have to make you the horizontal association where you would have to poke your nose, right? For example, I poke myself into water. Water is the second largest energy consumer, right? Uh, and, and, and if we don't poke ourselves into that area, you're going to see more and more of these issues come up. Air conditioning, as you know, is the cool load. Cool, and, cool load is the biggest in Asia. Where do we stop? Where do we stop, right? So I think some way we need to put a cap on this by saying, but I like, I, I think there was one question that we never even articulated well, and that was Andrew Dicker's question, which sort of led to what I call the transparency also that money raised is, if the focus is on the consumer wanting what he or she wants, and if we are able, not able to deliver what they want, what is the alternative? In other words, what do we do to the stranded assets? And is there no way of managing the stranded asset to deliver the, the architecture of the future? So I think somewhere, Reji, you need to probably bring this up in, 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 in another platform somewhere because I think we have the old legacy system, the more old the legacy is, the deeper it is to get it out of the rut. And so some of the countries, maybe like Africa will leapfrog into better systems, I don't know, Southeast Asia may, but the legacy system guys are gonna pull it hard and really hard to keep it the way they want because they've got billions of dollars stuck in their balance sheets, you know, for which somebody has to pay. So if there are no further questions on that, very happy note. Yeah, there is one point that I wanted to make real quick before we all leave. So we have been doing a lot of research lately about that architecture. And I wonder what you all think about the following. We, we believe, um, many of us now in the US believe that the shift to the new architecture will require a departure from AC to DC at the distribution level, where over time, the bulk of the DG generation will be more efficiently managed if it was all DC. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so let me answer that. I, I used to sit on the IEC's LVDC committee, but it was started some five, six years ago. It's still on, it's more or less coming. And from an efficiency perspective, yes, it is the best, okay, you, you have. but. There are technology challenges and practical challenges. One is the entire notion of a marketplace with equipment is all AC based. And so people are putting DC to AC inverters and then they are still putting the AC equipment, whether that is a fridge, 
whether that happens to be a heater, that happens to be a fan, etc. To go into the BLDC world, if you will, in its true form is, is proving to itself to be expensive. Second is the protection coordination, even on a home panel, if you take the one is to two ratio between your main to sub to sub, we're not getting that on the DC side. And so you have this issue of protection as to how much will you coordinate, how flat will it be? The third was, which we have now standardized is 48 volts on the low voltage side, 480 volts on the industrial side, which is now accepted at least by many, many countries now. So to move from 12 volts to 48 volts, we're now seeing the OEMs of the automotive sector and others not wanting to come there because their entire embedded system is 12 volts. The truck, truckers want 24 and the car guys want 12. So th there is this issue, right, as to what will win. And I think as the cost of these systems come down lower and lower and lower, uh, you're going to see the movement into DC. But the DC ecosphere, if you call it, in the marketplace, where the electrician, the parts, the stores, all that currently is not conducive to the DC parts at all. It's still AC. So even in rural India, where you've got solar powered pumps, many times they will actually invert it back to AC because that's a cheaper motor, right? You, 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 your DC motors become uh, sort of very expensive to manage, to either build or to repair at a local function. So it, it is moving that way, albeit slowly, but uh, at the IEC committee, if you are interested, you should move to the system Yes, it's called the SIS LVDC, uh, which has been in place now for about seven years now. Yeah, I think I, my last point would be that, um, you know, as we need to change, think differently, if you think of every building, every house, every structure becoming a self-generating power plant, exporting energy to the grid, uh, the, the notion of having a single large ISO managing the dispatch of this and the synchronization of that is usually old fashioned, right? We will need thousands of ISO at the microgrid level managing this so that we can gain that. I mean, the, 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 just the losses of dollars on the transfer from DC to AC is a gigantic number. I agree. So, okay, uh, there is our... over, to you. over to you. Yeah, on that two points which you said the first one if you uh, recollect one of the slides which um, Reggie, uh, 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 that can you hear me yeah now i can hear you yeah Okay, I said one of many slides talk, explained about how systems moving from tightly integrated asset-based systems to loosely connected services-based. So that is exactly the roadmap need to move from that. So, and on the 48 volt LVDC, oh, it took three, three years for us to fight the... I think I think Reggie, you're frozen or you're locked up. Reggie sits on the LVDC committee for India, and I've attended one or two yeah, of his committee. sessions. I, 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 no, there are other people who run the show, but I got all the teams. There are three LVDC teams in 2013-14 working. Somebody on 12 voltage, somebody on 24 voltage, and somebody on 48. So finally, we brought everybody together on 48, and then OEM started fighting, and they wrote to the extent to ministry that 48 is not good for cow. Cows will get electrocuted. <laughs> and fi finally, in 2018, we had one meeting and we, we standardized 48 volt LVDC, which is also, uh, we wrote the indoor uh, wiring standard, which is to be published, waiting for the IEEE one. So, a lot of work need to be done in all these areas. And uh, this was a very, very uh, intellectually stimulating, uh, interesting discussion. We hope that uh, every other conference and di discussions and debates. Absolutely, absolutely. As, as a center point. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all and hosting you all uh, next year at ISUW in Delhi. Thank you.